Prior to the First World War, ghostly apparitions across battlefields tended to be confined to large-scale skirmishes fought in the skies. In more modern times, American folklore has helped to spawn a cottage industry within the tourist trade of Civil War battlefields. The equation of such high death rates, paired with intense levels of trauma, seems to equate to an acceptance that wars were surely the perfect breeding grounds for the supernatural. Though this doesn't always appear to ring true, war is, nevertheless, a ripe area for some very bizarre stories. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Season 5, Episode 17 of Dark Histories. I'm Ben, as always. I hope you're all having a fantastic Halloween weekend. Happy Halloween. Before we start, I've got a little update to give you about um, some kind of interesting podcast stuff. For a little while now, Hallie, who helps me out with the organisational side of the podcast, has been working hard on untangling the mess that I made of the Dark Histories merchandise store. Uh, when I set it up, I was like in typical or like poor organisational fashion. I, I just made a mess of it, really. Um, so how he's been untangling the merchandise store and getting it all sort of reset up and, and actually usable now. It has been kind of usable and people have used it up until now. But it was a bit, I don't know, I, I guess I just set it up all badly. Uh, but Hallie's uh, basically gone in and, and untangled it all and made it a bit easier to use and uh, uploaded some new designs and things like that. As a kind of like relaunch of the merchandise store, there's a, a sale going on at the moment until the 2nd of November. So it's only like the, the over the next sort of 48 hours, really. Um, but I think it's 35% off. So if ever you were interested in like, you know, dark issue t-shirts, hoodies, things like that, then now's your, now's your chance to get them uh, like, you know, at a good sale price. So, um, yeah, thanks very much to Hallie for, for sorting that out. And, uh, yeah, like I say, if you're interested in Dark Issues merch, that uh, should be all sorted out now. I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but you can always find that from darkissues.com. But, yeah, that's about that. So let's crack on with this episode. This episode is called The Supernatural in Wartime. The First World War began in 1914. And though it lasted only four years, it was one of the bloodiest and most violent wars in history, thanks to the advancements in military technology and modern weaponry. Over 16 million military personnel died during the fighting, which pitted combatants into long, drawn-out battles in endless trenches, where they carried out a vicious stalemate, as commanders tossed body after body at the problem in efforts of stealing incremental gains in territory. There are no shortage of stories of horror, from those that took part in the fighting, and whilst many are self-explanatory and perfectly understandable, there are many that come from a stranger place. Perhaps the most infamous supernatural event of the First World War was the so-called sighting of the Angel of Mons, an otherworldly vision of an entity believed by many of the experiencers to have protected the British army during the Battle of Mons, one of the first major engagements of the First World War in August of 1914. The morning of Sunday the 23rd of August had been grey and misty, but by 10am the sky had cleared and a warm August summer's day shone down upon the small villages of Belgium. The area that was soon to become a battlefield was a swampy two mile wide coal field that ran alongside the Montcond Canal in the heart of the coal mining industry of Belgium. The British expeditionary forces, consisting of 70,000 men, were holed up amongst the towering slag heaps and roughly dug pits and were entrenched in what was a relatively weak position, facing down the barrel of 240,000 advancing men from the 1st German Army. In the early skirmishes of the clash, the British riflemen were able to hold back the German front line, despite having no strategic defensive position. However, they soon found themselves surrounded by the swarming German soldiers who poured across the canal bridges that they'd taken control of early in the fighting. By the evening, the French armies had retreated and the British were left stranded, wheeling backwards as they were repeatedly flanked. This went on until 2am, when the eventual retreat was ordered in the hopes of finding defensible positions to the southwest. 
the retreat by the British, was broken up by constant rearguard skirmishes and it lasted for 13 days and saw the battered armies walking over 200 miles back into France. The fighting had been a victory of sorts for the Germans, but it had come at a high cost, with over 2,000 dead and over 5,000 wounded. On the British side, over 1,600 men had lost their lives, and those left alive were tossed into a gruelling march that sapped at their strength. Not long after the Battle of Mons, stories began circulating about the front lines as some kind of divine intervention. During the retreat, chaotic as it was, there came reports of people who had seen some kind of supernatural guardian spirit that had protected the British troops from the German advance. We had almost reached the end of the retreat, and after marching a whole day and night, with but one half hour's rest in between, we found ourselves in the outskirts of Langy, near Paris, just at dawn, and as the day broke, we saw in front of us large bodies of cavalry, all formed up into squadrons, fine big men on massive chargers. I remember turning to my chums in the ranks and saying, thank God, we're not far off Paris now, look at the French cavalry. They too saw them quite plainly, but on getting closer, to our surprise, the horsemen vanished and gave place to banks of white mist, with clumps of trees and bushes dimly showing through. Over the following months, this story mutated from banks of white mists to visions of ghostly archers and gigantic beings in flowing white dresses. The fact that the British were outnumbered as they were, the visions at Mon quickly grew to legendary status, circulating in newspapers at home and in stories throughout the battlefields between the soldiers fighting abroad. Whilst it may have been the most famous vision of divine protection, it certainly wasn't the only vision reported throughout the war, and over the four years, a steady stream of stories came from people claiming to see similar visions across France and the home front. In January of 1916, J.G. Davies, a stretcher bearer in the King's Royal Rifles, based in Belgium, wrote of an angelic vision in the trenches of saint jean When further questioned about what he had seen, he described hearing a voice like the rolling of the sea and of the vision of an angel floating above the trenches with a trumpet in its mouth. Later that spring in May of 1916, a huge white cross was seen in the morning sky by a regiment of British soldiers that described it as sailing across until it reached the moon and disappeared. The whole time it was visible, an impromptu ceasefire was said to have silenced the battlefield. Naturally, Stories such as this played well for the purposes of propaganda, and the fact that the stories seemed to only come from the British side was quickly jumped on by journalists, who concluded that the visions were simply reflecting the power of good, whilst, so long as the Germans continued to act as fiends, they would continue to attract the power of fiends. Whilst there exists no hard evidence linking the government's propaganda arm formed earlier in that year, it has been suggested that the Bureau would have had an undeniable interest in fueling the stories. Not all reporting was so warm to the visions, however. The story of the Angel of Mon had been widespread, and for all the positive reports, it received its fair share of criticism and wariness too. Shortly after the story hit headlines, links were made to a relatively obscure story titled The Bowman, peculiar piece written by Arthur Machen in a pseudo-journalistic style published in the Evening News on September 29, 1914, and later published in a low-selling book. The story told of an army of angelic archers appearing in the skies above Mon, firing arrows at the German troops to protect the retreating British army. His heart grew hot as burning coal. It grew cold as ice within him, as it seemed to him a tumult of voices answered to his summons. He heard, or seemed to hear, thousands shouting, St. George, St. George. And as the soldier heard these voices, he saw before him, beyond the trench, a long line of shapes with a shining about them. They were like men who drew the bow, and with another shout, their cloud of arrows flew singing and tingling through the air towards the German hosts. In fact, Machen's bowmen were being credited for the Angel of Mon as early as 1915, when newspapers printed the story as being abused by Parsons across the land, who reprinted and propagated the story for their own religious ends. In 
while spiritualist groups were likewise reprinting the piece as proof for the afterlife. For every piece that questioned the story, however, there were numerous second-hand tales of men who had seen the visions and sworn by the truth in them. Angel at Mon, Cheshire soldier who saw the vision, signed affidavit, Mr. George S. Hazelhurst, Beaconsfield, Devonshire Place, Birkenhead, a member of a former well-known Runcorn family and a justice of the peace for the county of Flint, writes to the Liverpool Echo as follows. The Angel of Mon, Sir, Private Cleaver of the last Cheshire Regiment, was frequently in Birkenhead some months ago, but I did not hear of him until the end of his stay and failed to meet him. I thought he had left England. He frequently spoke to his friends in the canteen of what he had seen at Mon. To my great joy, I learned last week that he was only 40 miles away, and the next day I went to see him. He gave me the following words in writing. I myself was at Mon and saw the vision of angels. He also expressed his willingness to sign an affidavit to the effect. Well content, I returned home and the following day procured an affidavit and again travelled 40 miles to see him sign it. A copy is enclosed. If this meets the eye of any soldier who saw the angels, I hope he will sign an affidavit and send it to the press. To hide such a matter is to commit the sin of Herod, who gave not God the glory. I felt it was worthwhile, if necessary, to travel all around the world to obtain first-hand information of an event, which of its kind is more sublime and glorious than anything that has occurred on this planet, with one exception, Bethlehem. The document enclosed was as follows. I, Robert Cleaver, number 10515, a private in the 1st Cheshire Regiment of His Majesty's Army, make oath and say as follows, that I personally was at Mon and saw the vision of angels with my own eyes. Robert Cleaver, sworn at Kimmel Park in the county of Flint, this 20th day of August, 1915. Before me, S. Hazelhurst, one of His Majesty's Justices of the Peace, acting in and for the county of Flint. As the war rolled on, first-hand accounts of the Angel of Mon continued to be elusive. Even for the soldiers who were there, most everyone claimed to have heard the story by friends of friends, passing acquaintances or comrades. For the soldiers who had been there, the stories were easy to believe, though not always chalked up to anything supernatural. Private Frank Richards, a soldier who had fought at Mon and had been part of the British retreat, spoke of the exhaustion suffered by many of the men during the long march down through France. We were now breaking into the fifth day of continuous marching, with practically no sleep in between. Very nearly everyone was seeing things. We were all so dead beat. Similarly, Lance Corporal Johnston, a soldier who wrote a letter to the London Evening News, likewise blamed the conditions and physical state of many of the soldiers during the retreat for seeing visions. When I tell you that hardened soldiers who had been through many a campaign were marching quite mechanically along the road and babbling all sorts of nonsense in sheer delirium, you can well believe we were in a fit state to take a row of beanstalks for all the saints in the calendar. Stories such as these helped to propagate the Angel of Mons throughout the war. However, in reality, it seemed that it was all a little more than a fictional story, published in a newspaper, seized upon by propagandists, and mutated into a comforting folk story to tell on the front lines. It appears that one of the most famous folk stories from the First World War is precisely that. However, there are far less famous stories, and they have origins that are far less easy to trace. In 1930, Canadian veteran of war, William R. Byrd, published his memoirs on the fighting titled And We Go On. Within the pages, he told a story of a vision of his deceased brother, Steve, who had died in an earlier battle, guiding him out of trouble. About midnight, I was awakened by a tug at my arm. I looked up quickly, throwing back my ground sheet, and there stood Steve. I could see him plainly. I could see the mud on his putties and knees. He jerked a thumb towards the ruined house, and he motioned for me to go to them. I did not speak. I thought that if I could do exactly as he said and not wake the others, perhaps he would actually speak to me. He started to walk away as I gathered up my equipment and rifle and greatcoat, and when I hurried, he simply faded from view. I was disappointed. For at least ten minutes, I stood by a path, waiting, watching, listening, hoping he might speak or whisper. But nothing happened. 
and I grew cold, so I kept on to the nearest ruin, and there lay on a rough earth floor and went to sleep. The next morning, William began hearing stories of two soldiers killed by a shelling, and sure enough, upon further investigation, he found that it was the two men that he had been bunking down with before his brother had led him from the bivvy. All that day, I thought of how I had been saved, and I resolved that if I ever again saw Steve, I would do exactly as he motioned. He had saved my life. As it happened, Steve did visit William on several further occasions, each time motioning to him to move from his position, and each time saving him from capture or certain death. For sceptics, it's fairly easy to point out that William was an established author of military history and fiction who would go on to publish over a dozen books. His story is hardly unique, however, and stories from the battlefields of ghostly visions are numerous. In his book, Physical Phenomena of the War, published by Harold Carrington in 1918, Carrington also retells a story told to him by one Lieutenant Smith, a Canadian soldier with a false name. They were marching along, very fatigued, but undisturbed, except from the usual dangers of distant shellfire. Suddenly, Lieutenant Smith saw one of his men, Private Rex, begin to lag a little behind the rest, and judged that he might be ill. Watching him, he saw his pace continue to slacken until he was marching in line with himself. For a private to fall out and march beside his officer was, of course, unusual, and so the latter challenged the procedure. He asked the private if he were cold, but the private again said no. But Lieutenant Smith clearly saw that something was wrong with the man, and he therefore stepped closer to him and asked if he were hungry. The private replied, a little. The officer had a package of malted milk tablets in his pocket, and he gave him some. As he took them, the officer noted that his hand was icy cold, and he was very pale. Just at that moment, Lieutenant Smith's attention was diverted by the necessity of giving some commands to his men and of walking to another position. When he returned to his former place, he observed that Private Rex was no longer there. But as there had not been time for him to return to his own squad, the officer thought that he may have fallen because of his illness, or possibly because he had been wishing to desert. So he halted the regiment and went back some distance to look for the missing man. Thinking there was some trouble, a junior officer came running to Lieutenant Smith to give him assistance. The latter told him of how Private Rex had fallen out of his place, seeming to be ill, accepted the food tablets, and then suddenly disappeared. And the officer suggested that a search should be made for him. The junior officer, in great astonishment, replied that there must be some mistake, as Private Rex had been killed in battle, and he had attended the burial three days previously. Far from disturbing the lieutenant, the visions of Private Rex acted as a kind of comfort. It wakes away all fear of death, he said, for I know that Private Rex lives, though dead. Another story came from the British newspapers in 1916, when the vision of a colonel appeared to his old regiment at the moment of his death. A trench ghost, a weird story from the front. A real ghost story of the war is the description applied by the London Daily Express to the following. At the beginning of the war, a famous regiment left England for France. The colonel of that regiment was a man beloved by all his men, idolised by his young subalterns and highly thought of by his brigadier. For a year, the colonel led his regiment through the campaign in Flanders until one misty morning a hand grenade deprived him of an arm. The colonel left for England by the first hospital ship, and his regiment knew him no more. The colonel, after a few months, was fitted with an artificial arm, but he was not satisfied. He wanted, above all things, to get back to his regiment. He moved heaven and earth to get back there with his men, but that, he was informed, was impossible. If he liked, however, he could have the command of a garrison battalion, shortly leaving for the Dardanelles. Not being of an idle disposition, he took it after landing at Lemnos, one of the first to fall ill with dysentery was the colonel. He had sufficient strength to warrant his being taken to a hospital ship, however, and so for the second time he returned to England under the Red Cross. The hospital ship docked in England on a Tuesday, and midday on Wednesday the colonel was carried into the train which was leaving for London. He never reached that city, for he died at 12.30, just half an hour after the train had left. Now the extraordinary part of this story 
is that at the exact moment that the colonel died on the hospital train, a company in his old regiment saw him in their trench in Flanders. There was nothing out of the ordinary happening at the time, and beyond the usual number of exploding shells, the tick-tack of a machine gun, and the occasional bursting of a hand grenade, the morning was just as many others had been. The company were at their post, and the company sergeant major turned to a company commander. Beg pardon, sir. Here's Colonel, coming round. I didn't know he was back again. The officer looked up. There, standing with his cap just a little on one side, as he had always wore it, stood the Colonel. His field boots were caked with mud, and an old pair of binoculars were slung around his neck. The company commander was surprised, and started to walk towards him, when he dropped his stick. He stooped to pick it up, and when he straightened up again, the Colonel had gone. The officer dived down on a communication trench, and rushed for company headquarters. Did you see him? he queried, breathless. The three subalterns looked up at his question. See whom? Do you mean the Colonel? Yeah, we saw him, standing still, looking down the trench just here. We looked at him fully for a minute, and suddenly, he was not there. Can't make it out at all. Thought he was in the Dardanelles. Besides, all the men saw him too. And I don't know whether you noticed or not. He had both of his arms. It was not until the next week's mails arrived in the trenches that the regiment learnt of the colonel's death. They did not even know that he had left the Dardanelles until they read the fatal news. Over a hundred officers and men saw the colonel at 12.30 on that morning, saw him so plainly, so clearly, that all thought he had come back to the regiment for duty, and he looked so ordinary that it never struck those who saw him that could be anything but alive. Explanation? There isn't one. Your crystal gazer would label it clairvoyance, your telepathist telepathy. What would you have? Over 100 British Tommies saw the colonel that Wednesday morning. There it is. Believe it or not, as you like. The First World War was set in a time when ghosts were strong characters in fiction and a popular spiritualist revival was establishing new understandings of the afterlife and creating new definitions of what a ghost actually was among the general population. For men, surrounded by the dead bodies of their fallen comrades, many times sharing muddy trenches on the battlefields of Europe with their corpses for prolonged periods and suffering untold horrors on a daily basis, the stories of ghosts, hauntings and heavenly apparitions cover a broad range of classic ghostly purposes, from poor sense of danger and guardian angels to the timely apparitions of the dead showing themselves to their friends at the time of their death or beckoning them to the other side shortly before their own death. Whether they were the product of religious fervour, psychological trauma, or the residue of popular traditional folklore, or ultimately something more supernatural and unexplainable, the stories all helped to pave the way for what would be a surge in interest in spiritualism and psychical research in the years following between the wars. Beginning in Europe on September 1st, 1939, with the German invasion of Poland, The Second World War took a toll on almost every major continent across the globe. The largest and bloodiest war in history, the casualties number more than 60 million worldwide. From the carpet bombing of London, Berlin and cities across Europe to the Holocaust, the six years of war managed to contain stories of horror that consume generations. The outcome of the war proved to be a watershed moment in history that saw the axis of power tilt from Western Europe to America and the Soviet Union. Comparatively speaking, the Second World War falls far short of the first in its tales of ghostly hauntings and angelic saviours. Instead, when looking towards the strange and more fringe history of the conflict, it pays to look into the tales that came from the home front rather than the front lines. Back in England, established spiritualism was still going strong with over a quarter of a million paid up followers and thousands of local spiritualist circles popping up in cities and rural villages across the country. In the back rooms of village post offices, the tea rooms of local factories or the plush dining rooms of the world to do, small groups gathered weekly to conduct seances and contact the dead. One thing was for certain, that in a time of war, there was never a shortage of people looking for the sense of closure gained from speaking to dead loved ones. The Psychic News, a weekly British newspaper for spiritualists, whose name was, so the story goes, suggested to the founder by his spirit guide, 
was first published in 1932 and published continuously throughout the war years. Dealing primarily with stories of mediumship and seances, it had a habit of running some pretty sensationalist headlines, such as Life After Death Proved, Scientists Photographed Arm in Arm with Materialized Spirit, and Bible Prophets Were All Mediums. Throughout the war, most of the stories it printed were positive, upbeat pieces that extolled the virtues of spiritualism, often comparatively versus more traditional religions pushing tales of miraculous spirit healers and reminding people of the great comfort of knowing their deceased loved ones are still around. In many respects, it operated as a propaganda arm of the organised spiritualist church and partook in charity work, paid for in donations from the readers, as well as fundraising events and public seances, shipping gift packages or spiritualist books, along with the newspaper to members of the armed forces abroad. One of the newspaper's most celebrated figures of the day was Frank Lear, an English artist who lived and worked in Ireland as a newspaper cartoonist for much of his early life before moving to London, where he embarked on a new career as a psychic artist, drawing the portraits of dead men and women whose spirits were said to sit for him in his studio. An example of Lear's work featured on the front page of the Psychic News on the 3rd of October 1942. A hero who died in the raid on the German naval base at St. Nazaire, has returned and posed for a psychic drawing by Frank Lear, the famous clairvoyant artist. And this is what the young naval lieutenant's father writes from somewhere in Devon. It is a wonderful portrait. I and others who knew my son well consider it an inspired piece of work, a better portrait than any photograph I have of him. The son's name is withheld because his father is still inquiring into spiritualism and does not wish to give mediums any clues. The young naval lieutenant died, leading his men in the historic attack. The London Gazette, giving the citation which earned for him a mention in dispatches, referred to his dauntless devotion to duty at the forward gun of the motor launch which led the port column. Then, it adds, quite unprotected in the face of intense fire, at close range, he showed unshaken coolness until he was killed at his post. This is how a hero dies, and this is how he proved that he lives on in the world, before he gave all he had for a better world here. The piece wraps up by stating that the evidence provided by Lear proves that the survival after death is therefore incontestable. During the Second World War, spiritualism was reworking the understanding of ghosts and the afterlife. Gone were the gothic interpretations whose depictions were full of dread and horror as spirits tormented the living from the grave. Instead, they were replaced by far more positive, comforting images of calm, composed loved ones giving messages of reassurance and of the peace and tranquility of the other side. It was a strong, intensely reassuring image for a society that had seen entire generations wiped out on the battlefields of the First and Second World Wars and fitted far more smoothly into the home front narrative of fellowship and emotional resilience. If one digs deep into the archives, however, stories of more disturbing ghostly behaviour did occur throughout the war, particularly within the large old buildings that were routinely repurposed as temporary hostels where ghosts of a more gothic nature derailed the best laid plans. Oldbury House on St Michael's Hill in Bristol was built originally in 1689 for Marmaduke Bodler, a well-to-do wool merchant who would later serve in local government office as a high sheriff. Taking ten years to complete, it was a grand old three-storey building with large gables and low red brick walls around its front entrance to the street, lined with raw iron fencing. Its imposing monolithic facade is pierced by rows of sash windows and a single large dark wooden front door. By 1908, the house had passed from private ownership and had been converted into Oldbury House School, a preparatory school for boys that specialised in shorthand, bookkeeping and commercial subjects. By the Second World War, it had once more been converted and repurposed, this time as a hostel for women working at the BBC. Unsurprisingly, the 30 girls of the broadcasting company that had been stationed there were far from thrilled with their new environment. The house's large entrance hall 
let little light in through the wooden window shutters, so the staircase that flanked the left and right walls of the cavernous room were lit only by the dim, shadowy light of the oil lamps that lined the dark, hardwood panelling of the walls or from the embers of the 18th century marble fireplace. Things started pretty gently when the warden, Miss Methven Brownlee, saw the figure of a man dressed in white monastic robes and with a bunch of keys hanging at his side throughout the summer of 1941. At first, she chose to keep this story to herself, afraid of causing a panic amongst the residents, but after sightings of a group of five female ghostly apparitions, talking amongst themselves were seen repeatedly in the space of a few days, she was eventually approached by eight of the BBC staff regardless. All of the women had come forward separately to report the sounds of dragging footsteps and of doors opening and closing in the hallway outside their bedrooms throughout the night. Between the winter and spring of 1940 and 1941, Bristol had been the target of intense bombing raids by the German Luftwaffe and much like much of the rest of the country, was practicing a strict blackout. By night, the pitch black streets provided no light at all through the shuttered windows of Oldbury House and the hallways became ink-stained echo chambers bouncing the sounds of ghostly footsteps, slamming doors, and whispered musings of the ghostly gatherings seen throughout the house. Claiming they were more afraid of the ghosts in the house than of the raids going on outside, the BBC staff women were eventually moved to a new hostel in Western Supermare, and the house turned over to the responsibility of the Inland Revenue. When she was interviewed for the story in a 1941 newspaper, Miss Brownlee suggested a source for the supernatural events saying that she had been suffering from a poltergeist haunting in her home for some years and feared the ghosts had followed her from her house after it had been bombed out during a previous raid. A similar story came from Gill House, an old farmhouse near Bromfield in Cumberland. The house had been built on land that had been gifted to ancestors of the Ray family from William the Lion, King of Scotland, in 1110 for fidelity and services to the monarch. The most modern iteration of Gill House was built on the land in the early 19th century, before the land changed hands several times over the following 100 years. Surrounded by hundreds of acres of farmland, lined with tall hedgerows and tucked far out of sight from any local towns or villages, Gill House was a crumbling old farmhouse with a grand old Gothic porch attached to the rear of the building, its slate roof and large chimney stacks striking into the sky above its two storeys. During the Second World War, Gill House was used as a hostel for members of the Women's Land Army, a rural workforce of women recruited from the towns and cities of Britain to be stationed across the country. The women worked on a farmland and carried out farm, dairy and forestry work traditionally undertaken by men. However, with the majority of able-bodied having signed up to the armed forces, the WLA filled the void, oftentimes alongside prisoners of war. During their countryside tours, they often stayed in hostels that, for the most part, were large old farmhouses repurposed to house the influx of workers. The farmland around Gill House was perfect for the WLA, and so it was that by 1941, the house itself was home to 26 workers. Repeating the timeline of Oldbury House, the strange goings on in the house were initially treated as a spot of fun by the women. The nights in the house were cold, dark and silent as the rural countryside that crept in upon the walls, but strange sounds began to be heard, piercing through the imposing silence that normally rang through the old house. In the mornings, the women would joke together about footsteps outside their bedrooms, and the sounds of scraping coming from an old iron boot scraper that rested on the porch. Things took a darker turn, however, when apparitions were seen by several of the women that had appeared to walk through the solid walls and doors, and a ghastly smell which began sweeping through the rooms from sundown to sunrise, night after night. The whole affair came to a head when a scream erupted from one of the bedrooms in the dead of night, waking the occupants, who, upon investigation, found a distraught member of the WLA, panicked and in tears, sitting up in bed with a story that she had been strangled while some unseen force had tried to pull her through the bed. The women wasted little time after this event in contacting a local clergyman and requesting he visit the house to exorcise the malign spirit. 
The vicar and his wife agreed to stay the night in the hostel in order to see for themselves what all the fuss was about, but after an uneventful night, they left somewhat perplexed with what to do next, though both did admit that they felt the house was occupied by something unearthly. The vicar contacted the hostel's warden, Mrs Manby, and Mrs Howe, the local Cumberland County WLA organiser, who balked at the concept of a haunted hostel. The problem they faced, however, is that by now, all 26 women stationed at Gill House were refusing to sleep in the hostel at all, choosing instead to take shelter in the farm's barns. And so, they arranged to stay the night themselves in order to prove a point to the women and show them that there was nothing to be afraid of. Unfortunately, what happened that night is not documented. However, the following morning, Mrs Howe was said to have emerged from the house looking pale and haggard just before dawn broke. When asked what happened, she told the women only that she had suffered from three separate hair-raising experiences which nearly left me in a state of panic. Later the same day, she sent her recommendation to the WLA headquarters for Gill House to be closed for any future work. The Second World War was a difficult time for the entire country, even for those who pitched in from the home front, who often found themselves displaced through organisations like the Women's Land Army or through the evacuation programme. Amongst the stories of city and town folk who now found themselves in unfamiliar rural surroundings, there are many tales of the strange and unusual. The lasting national shock of the First World War had reshaped the popular perception of the afterlife with the thriving spiritualist movement, but it seems the anxieties of the people striving for the war effort in unfamiliar surroundings still managed to find a way to manifest itself in traditional fears. The Vietnam War was a protracted and violent war between the Communist North and the pro-democracy South that saw civil unrest in the West and huge numbers of casualties on both sides. War dead in the North had been estimated anywhere between 1.5 and 3.5 million, with many lost on the battlefield and their bodies never recovered, despite ongoing efforts to uncover the stories and final resting places of those that were left behind, missing in action and presumed dead. This ongoing search is dubbed the Wandering Souls Project, an organised charity drive seeking to use photographs, letters and military documents to trace the last steps of many of the lost dead in the hopes of discovering their unmarked graves of some 300,000 soldiers. The name of the project is borrowed from local Vietnamese folk beliefs concerning the fate of the dead. However, it's not the first time that the name has been used as part of an operation. One of the lesser known, more interesting and certainly stranger elements of the Vietnam War also utilised the name in what is now an infamous piece of psychological warfare known as Operation Wandering Soul. Weaving throughout the fighting, Vietnam saw widespread use of what was known officially as PSYOPs, a propaganda-based arm of the military with the lofty goals of winning the war without the need for unnecessary bloodshed with the idea that for every person that could be persuaded not to fight, lives could be saved on both sides of the conflict. In a war that was becoming increasingly costly for American lives, it was an outcome that was surely worth shooting for, even if it was only ever fractionally successful. Propaganda, and what would become known later as PSYOPs, in truth, wasn't new to the Vietnam War. With the everyday presence of widely circulated mass media, World War I saw early utilisation of specialised tactics in the form of distribution of pamphlets and fictional postcards from prisoners of war, waxing lyrical about their humane treatment on the other side. The leaflets were dropped from unmanned balloons, sent to the skies above no man's land and shot down by the enemy in an explosion of paperwork that fluttered down onto the battlefield and trenches below. In Vietnam, Tactics had progressed somewhat, and PSYOPs took on many different fronts. Airplanes and helicopters dropped literally billions of leaflets on villages across the country. The dropping of leaflets was so commonplace, in fact, that in 1967, the 7th Psychological Operations Group was presented with the Meritorious Unit Commendation Award for Exceptionally Meritorious Achievement in the Performance of Outstanding Service for dropping over one and a half billion leaflets in a single 18-month period. The leaflets ranged in their approaches from offering veiled threats of silent bombers to large rewards or of accusing the MVA soldiers or the government of being untrustworthy 
and preaching the dangers of communism, all the while with the aim to turn potential defectors towards the American cause. Along with the leaflets, the Americans tried several other tactics based on similar designs. TV and radio broadcasts were aired, along with helicopters equipped with loudspeaker arrays that would be tasked to fly over troubled areas and blare out recorded broadcasts. The main hope was to encourage potential defectors, much like the leaflets, but they also had the secondary benefit that, if nothing else, they would be bringing sleep deprivation upon the enemy soldiers. The tapes, however, were not always so straightforward, and some of the broadcasts got more than a little bit out there, taking the practice of psychological warfare to a far more experimental level. There were reports of subliminal messages being played in Vietnamese movie theatres, and perhaps, most famously, the playing of a recorded tape, now known as Ghost Tape No. 10, employed as part of a campaign dubbed Operation Wandering Soul. Operation Wandering Soul sought to capitalise on a traditional Vietnamese cultural belief concerning the dead. Despite the post-colonial government in Vietnam seeking to ban and eradicate some of the more superstitious elements of the country's folk and religious beliefs, many people still held deeply entrenched views on ancestral respect, the spirit world and the afterlife. For many, the Vietnam War, with its many casualties, was the ideal breeding ground for what were called angry spirits. In, these, in, the fo- in their folk beliefs, the angry spirits were the souls of people who had died in the fighting and considered lost if their bodies were not given a proper burial in its proper place within the boundaries of their homelands. An anonymous death, far away from home and without any proper burial treatment, would transform the dead into wandering souls who would be committed to an eternity of angrily preying on the living, stumbling aimlessly in eternal pain and suffering. Ghost tape number 10 used this concept to stoke fear into the Vietnamese army by playing a script of someone pretending to be a dead Vietnamese soldier. Realistically, despite any personal, spiritual or cultural beliefs, the tapes which utilised this script of a man who was apparently from beyond the grave wishing he could return home, or of a dead soldier's family crying and praying for their departed family member, it would probably have been equally effective for almost anyone who was stuck in the harsh conditions far from home and surrounded by the horrors of war on a daily basis. Saturated in heavy echo and reverb, the tapes were recorded in an echo chamber and began with the sounds of a traditional funeral procession. child's voice cries, Daddy, Daddy, where are you? The spirit then goes on to realise that he is dead and wandering endlessly, lost, and implores other soldiers to return home to avoid ending up like him. Utilised for the first time on the rivers of southwestern Mekong Delta region, the tape was broadcast from a boat that had cut its engines and drifted silently into enemy territory late one night. 
Allegedly, the operation resulted in 13 defections from the North Vietnamese Army. It could be argued that winning the hearts and minds had taken quite a strange turn, but ultimately, for the PSYOPs teams, it was still seen as preferable to scare the soldiers of the North Vietnamese Army into surrendering rather than to kill them in continual combat that was costly to the Americans in more ways than one. One Vietnamese veteran who heard the tape played in a different scenario recalled hearing it blaring out of a bank of speakers attached to an aircraft. We were on one operation that I remember hearing the most god-awful moaning and wailing and clashing cymbals coming from loudspeakers on an aircraft circling us. A great cacophony of noise alien to the western ear but powerfully evocative to the superstitious farm boys turned Viet Cong gorillas. It was Buddhist funeral sounds, I was told later. It kept me awake, and it scared the hell out of me. When asked in a BBC interview how PSYOP teams were viewed in Vietnam by the rest of the armed forces, Rick Hoffman, a PSYOP veteran deployed in Vietnam in the late 1960s, laughed. With scepticism, he replied, they didn't understand what we were doing. They looked at us as like some kind of magic show. But for the PSYOP soldiers, they were seemingly having a blast with their three-thinking ways. First Lieutenant Jerry Valentine of the 5th Air Commando Squadron said in a Stars and Stripes interview in 1968 of the tapes. The tapes are best. We've got one we call the Wandering Soul Tape. It lasts about four minutes. It starts with Buddhist funeral music, then this spooky wailing voice. Then a little child is crying. Then the child is crying for its father. Then a Vietnamese woman comes on and tells of how her husband was killed fighting for the VC. And all the time, this eerie background voice wailing about death. It's a real beauty, guaranteed to erase ground fire anywhere. It even sends chills down my spine. How effective the tapes actually were is seemingly still open to some debate, with veterans' recollections of the tapes on both sides having mixed reactions to the content and the outcome of its broadcast. One American soldier said of the tapes, The sound of the tape was chilling, even for non-Vietnamese troops. I had one pilot that simply refused to fly missions when we were going to play that tape. It freaked him out. Chad Spohr, PSYOP team leader of the 6th PSYOP Battalion in, in Vietnam from 1968 to 1969, said, I'd go out on a night ambush patrol with an American infantry unit with the 1st Cavalry and set up a small speaker in a tree and direct that toward an area where we suspected enemy troops were, and I'd play that tape for a couple of hours. There were a couple of occasions when I did that where we'd get a prisoner later and the interrogation would indicate that they'd heard the tape and they were frightened by it, so... I know that it had an effect. I know that it had an effect. One night after playing the tape and falling under sniper fire, an interpreter was sent into a local village to speak to the locals and tell them that if the sniper rifle was not turned over to the American soldiers, then the wandering spirits would be sure to return. As they were preparing to leave, an elderly woman was said to have approached the interpreter and told him he'd find the rifle in a feeding trough in one of the village's pigsties. The interpreter assured the informant that... Though the spirits may return, they would not harm her, nor any of her family. The fact that the tape was considered frightening, at least to the local farming population, and that the American cultural advisers had hit their target, was backed up by the fact that on several occasions, locals became reluctant to work in fields near the various broadcast areas. A North Vietnamese veteran interviewed by the BBC in 2017, however, claimed that the tapes only strengthened the resolve of the North Vietnamese guerrillas. Can you imagine what it was like for a soldier in a tunnel that had been far away from his family for years, at night, hearing those voices? It certainly affected the spirits of our fires. Those recorded voices made us think of what we missed. But afterwards, we were more determined to fight. This viewpoint is backed up by the fact that several American helicopter gunners reported their displeasure with having to replace their guns with banks of loudspeakers due to the fact that whenever the tapes were played, they were quickly shot at with no means to retaliate. 
the Tropic Lightning News, the official reporting publication of the United States Army 25th Infantry Division, published a piece interviewing several members of the S5 section of the 127th Wolfhounds in February of 1970 that mentioned the broadcasting of the ghost tape. We play upon the psychological superstitions and fears of the enemy. The method is very effective, Bonnie said. The tape makes the friendly villagers return to their homes and any suspecting persons who remain are questioned, Goodman said. A quick reaction sweep following the tape by the 127th Recon Platoon netted three detainees, one of who was jailed. It was the first time this type of tape had been used in the 3rd Brigade, and reviewing the results, we plan to use this method again, Bonnie said. Curiously, the Vietnam War wasn't the only time an American PSYOP team has utilised the supernatural to destabilise the enemy. In the 1950s, US military advisers to the government of the Philippines sought to take advantage of a local folk belief in a shape-shifting, vampirical creature known as the Aswang. The Americans first spread rumours of Aswang sightings throughout the villages before capturing a Marxist guerrilla sentry, draining him of blood, giving two wounds on his neck that they hoped would resemble the bite of an Aswang fang, and then returned him quietly to his sentry post, only to be discovered in the morning by his comrades. The operation was so successful that the entire area was apparently soon cleared of enemy fighters who had all fled en masse. Three different wars and three different generations and three very different interpretations and experiences of the supernatural. Over the years, the background of war has provided the horror fiction genre with a plethora of stories, but it's the true experiences, whether they are based in reality or something more psychological cultural or even social are oftentimes just as disturbing and, for my money, far more interesting. And that was my story of Ghosts in Warfare. We'll be back to chat a little bit, not much, just a little bit probably, about this week's episode after these short advert breaks. I would like to introduce to you an artist who is a long-term friend of Dark Histories, named Doodle Kev. Doodle Kev is a, an artist that I came across on Instagram uh, quite a while back, and he's a, a, a full-time artist, um, and he, 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 he draws in this fascinating way. He utilises um, what he calls stippling, or I guess what's called stippling, to create black and white illustrations. What that basically means is a series of thousands of tiny little dots on a page, and uh, he, he draws these illustrations that are all inspired by horror and folklore. He's done illustrations of Bigfoot and various mythical creatures and sort of famous witches and, and, and um, things like this. And they're all really great. And uh, and I've got a couple of pieces of his work myself. I've got a, a, a commission um, of the Dark Histories Butterfly that was done by him. It's, it's just absolutely beautiful. You might have seen it on my Instagram. A t-shirt by him as well, which is just uh, really great. That's uh, of uh, Vinegar Tom from... Uh, one of the old witch episodes um and it's it, a lot of stuff like that and it, it's just great you can find him on tiktok and instagram by searching for just just search basically doodle kev which is d o o d l e k e v or you can check out his shop over at doodlekev.bigcartel.com where he sells like uh, prints and stickers and t-shirts and such like that and you can also get um in touch with him through those channels and ask him to do uh, commissions of like one-off pieces and stuff as well and he did ask me to mention as well that if you do pick up something from the shop to let him know in the notes section before that you heard it from the podcast um, because he'll give listeners of Dark Histories a bit of a kind of a few extra freebies here and there so basically yeah just just say like in the notes section of your order if you if you do decide to order anything you know that, that you're heard about it from Dark Histories and he'll chuck in some extra stickers and stuff like that so that that's really cool of him and, and really nice of him to, to do that and yeah I mean um, check out his artwork say um, I found him on Instagram but he say he's on TikTok and Instagram named Doodle Kev D-O-O-D-L-E-K-E-V um, say or go check out his shop at doodlekev.bigcartel.com Long time listener of the show, really nice guy and really great artist who does some really cool artwork. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of really great uh, prints and stuff that would make excellent like Christmas gifts as well. So it's a pretty good time of year to get in there. But um, anyway, yeah, go check him out. He's, he's excellent. 
welcome back. Yeah, so that was my story of the the, the ghosts in the warfare. I guess um, if we just look at them sort of individually with the bigger ones. So the, the ghost of Mon, um, the angel of Mon, I found that really interesting, actually, because you have a few different views on this, where you've got the believer who, who, who obviously believes it all to be true. And then you've got the skeptic on, on, on the other hand that, that tends to usually use the idea that uh, the men in the, bat, in the battle or, or um, who were receding from the battle, retreating from the battle, were generally sort of in a poor psychological and physical state and that they would have perhaps seen this angel of Mon out of delirium. But interestingly, you've then got like a third sort of angle which says that both of those are wrong. And in fact, no one actually ever saw it full stop on the front and that it was just this book that had kind of got out of hand and been sort of retold and retold. And by the time it, it sort of reached the front lines via men coming in as replacements. So as as more men were shipping out to France, they were carrying the story with them that they'd read, obviously, at home. And then telling it to folks on the front lines, it then started getting recycled through the front lines and then came back around home again. So it, it sort of done like a full circle. And I find in a lot of ways, and I find in a lot of ways this is a much more interesting theory, actually, um, than than either of the first two. I, I The psychological one, and the, the psychological trauma idea, like the fact that there was probably a lot of men suffering from PTSD, things of that nature, I find that quite a really fascinating one. And I do think that's the explanation for a lot of the other stories that I found, especially a lot of the stories of men in trenches. Um, I saw, saw some stories of men in trenches that um, I saw one story and they... That, they a, a man was pulled out of the trenches and taken to the, like the hospital after he'd been living with his friends in the trenches or his, his comrades or whatever. And as far as he was concerned, he'd been living with them for like weeks. And it turned out that actually they were both dead and he'd been talking to them and living as if they were alive in his mind for, for weeks, apparently. And he he was basically removed and you know, totally suffering from like shock and PTSD and that. So you get these stories and I, I find them really fascinating. Um, you know, they're really interesting stories of supernatural in, in warfare. Um, but obviously they're, they're much more to do with like, the, the, the say like the psychological trauma. But then you've got like stories like the Angel of Mom where like I say, like actually it seems to me like a much more interesting story of just sort of, sort of like sort of folklore and the mutation of uh, an oral folk story. And how it, you know, it started off in England, and then gradually filtered around to the front lines in France, and then back from the front lines in France back to England, where when it returned to England, it almost had more believability because it was then coming from soldiers coming home from France. So therefore, it it, it was sort of seen as like, oh well, now it's legit, you know. But yeah, I found that really interesting that, that the way it did that. Um, the Second World War stories I, th I thought were interesting. I, I found it quite hard actually finding stories from the Second World War, um, but I, f I, th I found that interesting and I, I really enjoyed the stories of the, the, the WLA, the Women's Land Army. But they're, they're stories that are hard to really sort of believe either way, in a way, I find, because they're, they're, they were much more just sort of like small pieces in the newspapers and that there wasn't really any solid sources for them. So whilst I enjoyed them as stories, I feel that's all they really were. Um, of course, then we got the Vietnam story, and that's, I think, the most interesting of all of them. What I think I found most interesting about the, the Vietnam one is that a lot of the um, articles on this play up the superstitions of the Vietnamese in a way that really heavily reminds me of the, the way the old colonial press used to report on savages and barbaric practices of savages in 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 Europe during the sort of colonial period um and I, I found that really interesting as as a as a reflection on on how the American press treated the use of this tape to the on the Vietnamese it was just a, an interesting parallel I found anyway um it's not really it doesn't really mean anything but it, it was just an interesting parallel what I, my main takeaway from this though really was that these tapes like I say, that they, they kind of played up on this kind of the superstitions of the kind of the of the Vietnamese, and they really played heavily on that. But 
it re- in a way, it really didn't need to anyway, because I think they would have been effective for just about anyone. Um, you know, the idea of a, a tape that's being played to soldiers who are, are, are in a bad spot, they're, they're missing their homes m- almost prob- definitely, where they're seeing like horrible stuff and the weather's horrible and life's just a bit of a chore most of the time. They're probably knackered, sleep deprived. And then you're going to play this tape to them. It doesn't matter if you're North Vietnamese and you've got these kind of cultural leanings or not you're probably going to crap yourself anyway. You know, and, and to hear someone crying and saying they want you to come home and all the rest of it, I would say that would probably be effective for just about anyone. Um, and, and a really interesting use of fear. I found it really fascinating. And that that was um, like the um, the impetus for this episode, I guess. You know, I found it really interesting. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I'll, I'll leave that there. Thanks very much for listening. I say, I hope you had a fantastic Halloween Dark Issues is going to be back in a couple of weeks uh, with something a little bit murdery. Until then, you can contact me if you'd like. You can get in touch with me at contact at darkhistories.com, which is the email. Or you can message me uh, through social media. You can find all the links to that on darkhistories.com. And the links will also be in the show notes. Uh, yeah, and if you want to get in touch with me just about anything, like like please do go ahead. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much for listening. I'll see you in two weeks. Cheers. Sleep tight.